In 1997, Deep Blue, a computer made by IBM, defeated arguably one of the greatest chess players of all time, Garry Kasparov, in the best of six chess games. This was monumental because in defeating Kasparov in 1997, Deep Blue became the first computer to beat a world champion in what is regarded as one of the most intellectually challenging games. Now this laid the foundation for future breakthroughs in technology where AI would be able to beat world champions in even more complicated games like Go. So how did AI beat a world chess champion? Well, in a nutshell, Deep Blue won using its sheer computing power, as well as input from chess grandmasters to effectively evaluate and search for the optimal chess moves. And in this video, I'm going to explain how the technology actually worked in order to beat Kasparov in 1997. Don't worry if you're not from a computer science background, or even if you're unfamiliar with chess, because I'll look to explain everything as simply as possible. For those programmers watching who are curious to learn a bit more about the algorithms used, I have included some useful links in the description below. Well, some of you watching may be thinking, can't a computer just store all the possible chess moves and retrieve the right one at the right time? And the short answer is no, because there are too many possible chess moves. And according to the great mathematician Shannon, the number of possible chess games that could be played out is greater than the total number of atoms in the observable universe. Why am I telling you this? Not because I like maths, because it would be impossible for Deep Blue to store and retrieve information about every possible chess game that could have played out. But Deep Blue still needed to store millions of different possible chess games that could unfold. So how did the AI of Deep Blue know what the right chess move to make was? This was down to two key pieces of functionality. It's evaluation of chess positions and its search functionality. Programmed into the hardware, Deep Blue's evaluation would assess which player was winning in the given moment. Now, Deep Blue could very quickly calculate the current state of play by assessing the number of pieces on the chessboard, the value of each piece on the chessboard, and where the pieces were positioned on the chessboard. These steps could be done within one electronic pulse or one CPU clock cycle, as they were very quick to calculate. This type of evaluation wouldn't be enough, however, because Deep Blue was up against a world chess champion and it also needed to more carefully evaluate the chessboard. So a slow evaluation scan was also implemented, where each column or file in chess terms was scanned one by one, computing values such as the king's safety, whether any chess pieces were being pinned, square control, and if there were any rooks on the seventh rank. These evaluation techniques would result in a single value being produced. IBM worked with chess grandmasters and their expertise on the evaluation of chess games acted as input for Deep Blue. Once Deep Blue had evaluated the current state of play, the further ahead it could see against Gary, the better the move it could make in the present moment. Deep Blue would look at, on average, 100 million chess positions per second. Now, how could it possibly do this? Well, the answer is parallelism. 30 pieces of hardware which would do calculations, also known as processors, would work at the same time. One processor was a master at 135 megahertz which means it was capable of fetching and performing 135 million instructions in just one second. Now you may be thinking that number is quite big, but in today's terms, it's actually quite small. And to put it into context, your average computer today has processors which are 26 times faster. This master processor would examine the first few set of possible moves. Based on this initial analysis, the remaining 29 processes working at 120 MHz would search deeper for more possible chess outcomes. Even with parallel processing, Deep Blue still used clever search techniques to minimize any search results which would lead to an undesired move because not every possible chess move is a good one. One of these clever tricks was called a quiescent search technique which would ensure any piece captures after a move was made were accounted for before returning an evaluation score. Another key technique which was used by Deep Blue and is still used today in chess engines like Stockfish is alpha beta pruning. This code written in the programming language C would act as a set of rules or algorithm for effectively deciding what move Deep Blue should make based on what Gary would play to maximize his chances of winning. 
if we imagine deep blue played as white here and Gary's black, the white colour here represents the deep blue's turn. The black colour represents Gary's turn. And to keep things simple, assume this bottom layer represents where deep blue has stopped its search. As discussed earlier, deep blue would return a score based on the evaluation of the chessboard. Deep blue would look to make a move with the highest possible score, where the higher the score, the better the move is for deep blue. Gary would look to make a move with the lowest possible score, i.e. which was worse for deep blue and better for Gary. At these stages, the maximum score would be returned. And at these stages, the minimum score would be returned. Using code and through a coding technique called recursion, the maximum score from these two possible moves Deep Blue could make would be returned. In this case, two. Deep Blue would assess another possible move it could make at this stage of the game. The score four is initially returned. The function at this level here only looks for the maximum value. Because four is already bigger than two, there is no way Gary would make this move because this is a worse move for him. As it's a worse move, Deep Blue stops assessing this move further or prunes the tree branch here of minus one. This saves compute time as it doesn't need to look at moves it knows Gary won't make. The minus one can be ignored because when it's Gary's turn, Gary wouldn't make a move which was better for his opponent and worse for him. If we apply our logic to the other side, it means that because one is smaller than two, there would be no point assessing at a deeper level these possibilities, as it isn't in Deep Blue's best interest, because Deep Blue at this stage only wants to make the move which is best for itself, i.e. the move with the highest score. So Deep Blue doesn't need to compute these possibilities and can actually prune here. After completing our mini chess game tree, we start to see using bottom-up analysis that the best move for Deep Blue to make is this one, factoring in Gary's moves after we play. This is how Deep Blue could search for the optimal moves efficiently. Transposition tables were also used where positions previously seen by Deep Blue were stored in memory to avoid unnecessary compute time in searching. What made Deep Blue so brilliantly engineered was not just its clever use of advanced algorithms or enhanced computing power from previous versions, but its deliberate programming to psychologically rattle Gary. Deep Blue knew its specific order of pieces to move or line in chess terms, but would reach its destination in a more unpredictable way. Deep Blue was also programmed to appear more uncertain than it actually was. Deep Blue would occasionally pause before declaring its move, sometimes for several minutes. From Gary Kasparov's point of view, it seemed as if the machine was struggling, churning through more and more calculations. However, Deep Blue was just sitting idly by. Advanced algorithms, input from chess grandmasters, with the cheeky little bits of psychological trickery, is ultimately what led a computer to defeat a world chess champion for the very first time in 1997. Chess engines today have come a long way since Deep Blue. Now they're using neural nets, but that's for another time. Thank you for watching.